I have the privilege of speaking. Um, sometimes it's a privilege, sometimes it's not. But I have the privilege of speaking at a lot of different conferences. And as a, as a guy who uh, travels and speaks at different conferences, I can tell you that conferences and conference speakers can be terribly dangerous. Okay, I mean, maybe the most dangerous contexts in the world are conferences, and the most dangerous people in the world are conference speakers, because almost every single one of them that I've been to, uh, with good intentions, try to inspire you by telling you to do something radical, to make something great of yourself, to change the world. I mean, it seems like each conference speaker tries to outdo the one right before them by giving some remarkably inspiring word that will get the hearers to go out and do something radical and sacrificial. And uh, there's, such, there's such an emphasis on doing more and trying harder, but it's, it's said in spiritualized language so that what what hearers leave understanding is that they're doing this for God, okay? In fact, the more they do for God, the more God, imp- more God will be impressed with them, and perhaps the more God will do for them. And without realizing it, uh, they tie up heavy burdens and place them on the shoulders of people infinitely too small to bear those burdens, Um, And ironically, even though the burden feels heavy, a lot of conference goers keep going to conferences like that um, because there's something very appealing about being told that you can change the world. There's something very appealing about being told that you can become something great, you can do something great. It's appealing to us because we all want to prove our worth and establish our value by doing something great, by becoming someone great. Um, I mean, there's a sense in which obviously we all feel this deep need to secure a sense of significance and to be approved and accepted and loved. And, and we conclude that if we're going to experience these things, we have to make it happen. And so conferences, both the goers and the speakers, become a cesspool um, of uh, law, law-bearing, law-giving places where people leave burdened, exhausted, like I was talking about Friday night. Well, I say all that to say this is exactly why I love Mockingbird. Mockingbird, in a sense, is sort of the anti-conference conference, uh, and it's filled with anti-conference speakers, speakers. <laughs> Um, I mean, the whole goal of the whole goal of Mockingbird is that you would feel lighter when you leave, less burdened, taking yourself less seriously, taking grace more seriously. Um, that's an amazing thing, and so I hope and I pray that um, we, as a collective group, will do everything we can to continue to promote. Uh, everything that uh, the Mockingbird team is uh, seeking to do and accomplish. It's just, it's a real joy to be a part of it. I I feel like, I've told David this a few times, but I was born and reared in uh, the evangelical world, and, um, and, and David was born and reared in a different world, <clears throat> and yet, um, when I think about Liberate, when I think about Mockingbird, I think about uh, these two efforts standing back to back. Um, and what's so fascinating to me about that is uh, it's proof positive that uh, the gospel transcends theological boundaries, uh, various traditions, uh, cultural baggage. It's amazing to me. Um, and so I just, I love being... I love being a part of it. Well, I, I want to, I want, I don't, I don't remember what the assignment was this morning. It doesn't matter because I, if I don't remember it, I didn't prepare for it. Um, so, um, but I, what I do want to, what I do want to talk about for a few minutes this morning, um, and every time a preacher says a few minutes, it usually means he's going to be here for 45. So, uh, that I will do my best not to, to be here for 40. In fact, what time am I supposed to be done? 1045? 11? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, like 15 minutes? 
30 minutes, but I've already spoken for 10, so 20 minutes? 20 more minutes. Whew, all right, here we go. Um, one, of the, one of the questions, I mean, I am, a, um, I am unapologetic in the deliverance of the message of grace because it saved my life. And uh, for those who are responsible and called by God to deliver this message and who are unapologetic about it, you take, you know, you, you get your shots, you know. People come after you. Either it's people inside the church who go, now, wait a second, I get it, but, I mean, you need to tell us what to do. Every time someone comes up to me and says, would you please tell us what to do? I said, you want a to-do list? Okay, here's one for you. Be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, put that in your pipe and smoke it and thank God for Jesus, okay? Just shut up. Shut up. All right, that's what I feel like saying. Um, so, uh, but, um, but I mean, you, we, we get it, you know, you get people who object to this message because they're so, their hearts are so law locked like mine and they're obsessed with wanting to control their lives and wanting to control the people in their lives. And that's what makes them feel safe. And that's what makes them feel secure. And, um, and they, they figure that if they can control their lives, they can generate significance and they can generate worth and they can protect themselves from the bad stuff and all that stuff. And so they want to be told what to do. And a lot of people come to church on Sunday mornings wanting to be told from a spiritual guru what to do because their kids are going off the deep end or their marriage is falling apart or, and they think that what they really need is a checklist. Give me three steps to a happy marriage and I can guarantee myself a happy marriage if I can simply do these three steps. Okay. So when you refuse to, when you refuse to preach that, when you refre when you refuse to preach a to-do list version of the Christian faith, um, then people object, you know? I mean, it's just natural. So you get shots from inside. You get shots from outside. Christian leaders, the, the religious elite hate this stuff. <laughs> they really do. A lot of them do, anyway, at least in my experience. Um, because it threatens everything they have built, you know? Um, and so they just, they just think that if you, let, if you let this wild dog out of its cage, it's going to destroy everything we have worked so hard to build. You know, that the goal of the Christian life seems to be behavioral modification. Um, and when you speak about grace the way that you do, uh, it, it doesn't encourage behavioral modification. In fact, it discourages it. Okay, that's the objection. Um, well, one of the other objections that come is, doesn't this make you lazy? <laughs> I mean, do, doesn't... Doesn't the preaching of grace make you lazy? Doesn't it encourage an I don't care posture toward life? I mean, the gospel, as I mentioned the other night, the gospel doxologically declares that because of Christ's finished work for you, you already have all of the justification, all of the approval, all of the love all of the security, all of the worth, all of the meaning, all of the rescue that you long for and that you look for in a thousand, in a thousand smaller, in a thousand people and places infinitely smaller than Jesus. It announces that God does not relate to us based on our feats for Jesus, but God relates to us based on Jesus' feats for us that Jesus came to liberate us from the force of having to fix ourselves and find ourselves and free ourselves. He came to rescue us, as I mentioned Friday night, from the slavish need to be right and rewarded and regarded and respected. He came to relieve us of the burden that we inherently feel to get it done. Okay, that's what the gospel declares. It announces that it announces that it's not on me to ensure that the ultimate verdict on my life is pass and not fail. And this means that you don't have to transform the world to matter. You don't have to turn out good kids to secure your own worth. You don't have to be a success to justify your existence. As I, made, as I said um, uh, the other night, Thursday night, uh, I think it was Thursday night, that because Jesus was strong for you, you're free to be weak. Okay? That because Jesus won for you, you're free to lose. Um, because Jesus succeeded for you, you're, you're free to fail. Because Jesus was extraordinary, you're free to be ordinary, okay? That our great hope is not in our transformation, but Christ's substitution, 
And you can either live your life believing that your greatest hope lies in what you can become and what you can do, or your greatest hope lies in what Jesus has done for you. Um, so when you, when you preach this stuff unapologetically, it's, it's inevitable that people are going to say, okay, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Doesn't this generate apathy? I mean, if it's true that Jesus paid it all, <clears throat> that it is finished, that my value, worth, security, freedom, justification, and so on and so forth is forever fixed, then why do anything? I mean, literally. So it's one of the questions I get on a regular basis. Then, then why do anything? I mean, doesn't grace undercut ambition? Doesn't the gospel weaken effort? Okay, that's the, one of the chief objections that you'll get. Um, and the fact of the matter is, gospel grace actually empowers risk-taking effort and neighbor-embracing love. It actually empowers it. It has the exact opposite effect as what we might think it would have. And let me kind of tease this out for you a little bit so you understand what I'm talking about. Um, if you think about your own life for a minute, as I think about mine, the thing that prevents us from taking risks is the fear that if we don't succeed, we'll lose out on something we need in order to be happy, and so we live life playing our cards close to the chest. Okay, I was speaking at a, uh, like a businessman's luncheon, uh, and it was a bunch of uh, young, sharp, professional guys in their 20s and 30s. And so I'm, I'm, I'm preaching this message of because Jesus was strong for you, you're free to be weak. Because Jesus won for you, you're free to lose. And, and then I did a question and answer session with these men afterwards. And the first question was, um, okay, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and there's a part of me that really resonates with what you're saying because it relieves it relieves me of pressure, but, I mean, doesn't this just undercut ambition? I mean, we, we're a bunch of young guys who really, really want to uh, do something great, and doesn't this discourage us from doing that? And I said, actually, no, you know? I, first, I said, <clears throat> I, I said, let me, I mean, you're young, so I'll give you a pass, but I said, let me just describe for you uh, me at 25 and me at 40, at 25, this was me. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to change the world. I mean, just I'm ready to go. Take the bull by the horns, change the world. The world was going to be radically different because I was alive, all right? This is me at 40, okay? I can't change myself. I can't change my wife. I can't change my kids. Thank God for Jesus. So I said, life happens, and uh, thank God uh, youthful idealism is crushed by life, and then you become a realist. And the moment you become a realist, you become much more deeply appreciative of who Jesus is and what he's done. Um, I was telling someone the other day that the only people I know who have deeply internalized this message are the people who, at one point in time in their life, or, or in a successive you know, seasons of life, have just crashed and burned. I mean, until you are lying flat on your back, you just won't fully get it. Um, and so, uh, so this guy says, now, doesn't this, you know, I mean, we, we want to do something great, you know? And I said, well, you'll stop wanting to do something great, hopefully, at some point. Um, and um, I said, but this message actually has the exact opposite effect. The exact opposite effect, because if you think about it, um, what is the thing that prevents you from taking even greater risks. Okay, what is, what is the thing that, and, and think about it in terms of, you know, your marriage or your relationships or whatever. What is the thing that gets in the way of you loving the person next to you with reckless abandon, with absolute sacrificial love and service? I mean, I've been married for almost 20 years, and, um, uh, you know, I... I um, we, we measure our relational investments. We all do. And for the first five years my wife and I were married, we measured our relational investments toward one another very, very carefully. And the reason is because we felt like um, I, in, I, in order for me to make 
an investment in you. I need my investment in you to come with some guaranteed return. Okay, I mean, I'm, I, I will love you sacrificially to the degree that I believe I will get sacrificial love from you in return. And, uh, and if I'm not confident that, I, that you, my love for you will be reciprocated, well, I'm going to keep my relational cards close to the chest. And so we actually measure our investments carefully because we need a return. We're afraid to give because it might not work out, and we need it to work out. We need it to work out. But because everything we need in Christ we already possess, we can take great risks we can push harder. We can go farther. We can leave it all on the field without fear. We can invest with reckless abandon because we don't need to ensure a return of success or love or meaning or validation or approval. We can invest without needing anything in return. In other words, we can invest freely because we have been freely invested in. So far from this message actually producing apathy... It actually empowers us to take greater risks, to love with more reckless abandon. Because now, because this is, now I can do, because everything I need in Christ I have, I can do everything for you without needing you to do anything for me. And that, that transforms every relationship you will ever have. I mean, that saved my marriage, literally saved my marriage. It saved my relationship with my teenage boys, okay, really. I mean, you know, I know this is silly and it sounds stupid, but, um, you know, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a relatively good dad. You know, I take my kids to Miami Heat basketball games. I take them to movies. I take them out to dinner. They don't ever have to pay for anything, blah, blah. I mean, I feel like I'm a pretty good dad. Well, you know, the other, I mean, I'm really, really nice. I should win Father of the Year award uh, each and every year from my children at least. And, um, and uh, you know, they rarely say thank you. It's unbelievable. And I was thinking about it the other day, and I was like, you know, I, this is starting to bother me. I mean, I had just taken him to see G.I. Joe uh, with The Rock. He's jacked in that movie. It's unbelievable. Made me want to take steroids and go to the gym. It was unbelievable. Um, I take him to go see G.I. Joe, uh, and we come back. I took him out to dinner, and I took him to go see a movie. I mean, I was taking, I was taking time out of my precious schedule, okay, where I could have done a lot of productive things to go hang out with my boys like good dads should, all right? The least they could do when we get back in the car after the movie is, hey, thanks, dad, you know? Not a word, okay? It was like, hey, can we stop and get something else on the way home, you know? I'm like, listen, you little spoiled son of, I can't say that because it's my mother, it's my wife, whatever. Um, um, but I mean, literally, and I remember thinking, okay, I, and it, God just stopped me in my tracks, and he said, do you understand that you can love your children with reckless abandon without ever needing them to say thank you? Ever. I mean, it's good when they say thank you. It's polite when they say thank you. They should learn to say thank you when someone does something nice for them. But you don't need it. You don't need it ever because everything you need in Christ you have. You can serve your children for the rest of your life without ever needing a thank you. Okay, now that... That just transforms things um, in, in relationship to my wife, you know? I mentioned the first five years of our marriage, I was convinced that if she would just become more like me, everything would be fine, you know? And she was convinced that if I would just become more like her, everything would be fine. I mean, literally. And so we spent the first five years of our relationship trying to change each other, and our marriage sucked, all right? Because, I mean, we just, you need to become more like me. No, 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 you need to become more like me. And we were scared to love each other. Because we really didn't believe the gospel. We were scared to love each other. I mean, I was scared to love Kim because I, I needed, in order for me to feel like I mattered, in order to justify my existence, I needed love and respect from my wife. And so I would, I would love her to the degree that I could think that she would love me back. Or I would invest love in her to the degree that I was pretty sure she would invest love in me. Um, and there was just no, I'm giving my all to you, and you're giving your all to me, and I'm giving my all to you without needing you to give your all to me. I mean, it's a wonderful thing when I experience love for my wife and three kids. I mean, I love it. I, I revel in it, you know? But there's a far different thing from saying, I enjoy the love that I get for my wife and kids, and saying, I need 
the love that I get for my wife and kids. Because as I said a minute ago, what happens when this message takes root is you begin to view your relationships in terms of I can now do everything for you without needing you to do anything for me. So I can love you more. I can sacrifice more. I can, I can love you. I, I, can, I can love my enemies with reckless abandon because I don't, I, don't need anything, I don't need anything in return. I can forgive you without you asking for forgiveness. Okay? Um, I, can, I, can, I, I don't have to be bitter towards you. Because, well, I mean, think about where bitterness comes from. I mean, James talks about this. You know, where, does, where do fights and quarrels come from? They come from this internal sense that I'm, I'm entitled to something that I feel like I deserve that I'm not getting. That's where they come from. I mean, it's, it's self-salvation projects, as I mentioned the other night. I mean, it's, I, I need to get my own justification. I need to get my own worth. I need to get my own value. I need to get my own meaning. Um, I need to be right. I need to win. Um, I need to be someone. I need you to think that I am someone. Uh, and when we don't get that stuff, we become jealous, we become angry, we become bitter. Well, the gospel frees you from all that stuff. I mean, it's just, it's, it's the good news, as I mentioned the other night, that the keys are already in your pocket. So, um, the fear, what happens when this message takes root is the fear of not knowing what might be returned is replaced by the freedom of knowing that we already have everything. <laughs> um, as I said, because everything I need in Christ I have, I can now do everything for you without needing you to do anything for me. That's, that's, that is grace on the ground of relationships. It's amazing. I mean, it will radically transform everything. So now I can actively spend my life giving instead of taking. I can actively spend my life going to the back instead of getting to the front. I can actively spend my life sacrificing myself for others instead of sacrificing others for myself. And you know, you know how enslaving those things are. Trying to fight your way to the front, it's just such a burden, you know? Um, trying, to always, trying to always get and extract from other people when when your relationships are marked by needing to get something from that other person, I need something from you in order for me to feel like I matter, it's, it's, a, it's slavery. Um, you know, every, every attempt on our part to fix someone else, every attempt, uh, is actually a subtle attempt to fix ourselves. I need you to become a certain way if I'm going to be happy. Okay? Um, and it's just... It's enslaving. I mean, it's, it's absolutely uh, a burden that we, that we can't bear. And the gospel alone liberates you to live a life of scandalous generosity. It liberates you to live a life of unrestrained sacrifice and uncommon valor and unbounded courage and all of these things because you don't need anything. You don't need anything. So now you can give everything. Uh, I don't need thank yous from my sons. And when they say thank you, it does, I mean, it just, it's enlivening. Okay, I love it. Um, and I give thanks to God for, for generating in my sons a heart of gratitude. I, I thank him for that. But I don't need it. I, I, I don't have to go to bed bitter because they didn't say thank you and wake up tomorrow morning and say, you know, last night, guys, I was really bothered because I spent the whole evening with you and I spent, you know, 200 bucks on you and you didn't even say thank you. I don't have to, I don't have to go to bed feeling angry and I don't have to wake up with expectations. I told Jenna, my daughter, um, and, and it doesn't work anyway, okay, because I told uh, Jenna, we were on our way to church one Sunday and I was getting ready to use an illustration on Sunday morning and I used Jenna, who rides with me to church, as an experiment. I said, let me ask you a question. When mom and dad take you out to dinner and we get back in the car and mom says, guys, what do we say to dad for taking us out to dinner? And thank you, you know. I said, Jenna, when that happens, when that's going on inside the car, um, do you ever say thank you in those moments uh, because you really want to? 
And she was quiet for a minute, like, I'm not exactly sure what to say here because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, uh, and she, I said, you can be honest. You're not going to get in trouble. There, you, you know, you're not going to get in trouble. Say whatever is true. And she said, no. Um, whenever mom says, say thank you, I say it because I don't want to get in trouble, but I'm not saying it because I'm really thankful. And I said, that's just, you know, that's, that's just a picture of the incapacity of the law to accomplish in us what only the gospel can. So it doesn't work anyway. Not only are you bitter when you're going to bed, my kids didn't say thank you, my kids didn't say thank you. I'm going to wake up tomorrow morning and teach them a lesson. It's important to say thank you. You know, you're not going to get anywhere in this world if you don't learn to say thank you, okay? Um, not only does it, but then if I did do that, I say, you know, guys, blah, 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 blah. Is that going to make them go, oh, gosh, Dad, I'm so sorry, you know? We are. We're spoiled brats. We really are, and we're sorry, and, you know, I, I'm... Thank you for last night, and I'm sorry. It never happens. Well, Dad, I, I didn't even think about it. Well, you should think about it. I mean, you should, but I mean, I, and then it's, you know, they go off to school and everyone's fighting. It doesn't work anyway. So the fact that God frees us from that, frees us from need, it's unbelievable how radical the gospel is, how scandalous it is in the sense that it frees us from need. Um, so now I'm, I'm capable of loving my neighbor. Uh, because I don't, I don't need to love myself by extracting something from you so that I can justify myself. So when you don't have anything to lose, you discover something wonderful. You're, you're free to take great risks without fear or reservation. And that was my answer to the young business guy who asked me the question. I said, this actually empowers you to take greater risks. I mean, this, this empowers you to leave it all on the field without needing anything in return. Uh, it, it frees you from the burden of having to keep your cards close to the chest and measure your investments. And this is really the difference between approaching all of life from salvation and approaching all of life for salvation. Huge difference. This is, the, this is the difference between approaching all of life from our acceptance and approaching all of life for our acceptance. It's the difference between approaching all of life from love and approaching all of life for love. And the gospel empowers us to approach all of life from and not for. And that changes everything. So I'll close with this in the, in the remarkable... Uh, mind-blowing, paradigm-shattering, uh, scandalously liberating words of Gerhard Ferdy. So what are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? It's amazing, unless... When I, when I pose that question um, to people, to Christian people, they're like, you can't, you can't say that. There's a whole bunch of things we have to do. And I said, no, there's not. You don't have to do anything. There, there are plenty of things that you get to do, <laughs> but there's nothing that you have to do. Jesus paid it all. If you are a Christian, you live your life under a banner that reads, it is finished. And the most sensible, logical question that any Christian person can ask and wrestle with is, so what am I going to do now with the rest of my life? that I don't have to do anything. And when, when you wrestle with that question, when your heart wrestles with that question, you rediscover the now power of the gospel, and it sets you free to live a life of scandalous generosity and loving the people around you with reckless abandon. It's, it's living a liberated life, the free life. Let's pray together. I speak to you as a, a preacher who's often, I, I totally resonate with everything you say, especially when people come to me and say, what do I do? <laughs> yeah, but uh, how do we get this through? Is there any hope to Pharisees and elder brothers? Mm. Have you had luck with that? And uh, in what ways? Um, no, there are no formulas just because I can't change and you can't change hearts, you know? Um, I think for me, um, not buckling under the pressure 
You know, I mean, we had a couple. Uh, my wife came home on Tuesday and told me that a couple that we know and like a lot uh, are leaving our church to go to another church. And when my wife, Kim, asked why, she said, because my husband and I just need to be told what to do more. Um, and, you know, I mean, th those, those, those things are heart-wrenching. You know, I mean, these are people we like. When people we don't like say that, we're like, thank God, <laughs> see you later. But these are, this was actually a couple that we liked. Um, and, um, you know, I just, I told my wife, I said, we're, we're, this message confronts the human condition. This is not, this is not, um, you know, this isn't a battle between personalities. Um, I mean, this message really does confront the human condition. We are, ever since Genesis chapter 3, we have been addicted to being our own God, addicted to control, um, addicted to saving ourselves, addicted to establishing our own righteousness, and for whatever reason, uh, we've come to believe that um, if we can just develop a checklist and successfully check off the boxes on our list, we'll experience our best life now, you know? Um, and so, I don't, you know, is there hope? Yes, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Absolutely. I don't, I never lose hope, uh, because I know that God has the power to break through unbelief. But as Luther said, the sin underneath every sin is unbelief. That's, that's the root of all of our sin. And that's what we're battling. And so I would just simply encourage you to press on, um, it's amazing, the, whenever I hear objections, I preach it with more fervor. Uh, I don't back off, I press the gas. Uh, sometimes that gets me in trouble, but, um, but I mean, I just, you know, it's, it's the Apostle Paul, this is, he was addressing a different issue, but, you know, in Romans chapter 4 and 5, he speaks about the radicality of the gospel and the scandalous nature of God's mercy, and, and then he anticipates the the typical question, you know? Um, okay, so what does this mean? Chapter 6, is this, should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? And you would expect Paul at that point to sort of put the brakes on grace and balance everything he said with law, give them a to-do list, um, a checklist of ways they can evaluate themselves to determine whether or not they're really Christians. You'd think, you know, it would be tempting to do that. Uh, but he doesn't. He says, if that's your question, you obviously, it's not that you get grace too much, it's that you get it too little. So he presses it in deeper. I mean, he floors it. And he goes deeper into the gospel. Um, and so I just, that's sort of been my MO. You know, when I hear people not getting it, it makes me press it deeper. Um, and, you know, after a while, to be honest with you, the people who just won't give up, they'll leave. They will. Um, and... Um, and what will happen is word, and this is what's happened at our church, word will get out that this is what the message is there. And before long, you see a brand new church populated with burned out, broken people who see this message as their only hope and lifeline. And that changes everything. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll continue to have thorns in our side in the form of people. Uh, you just, you know. So, anyway, I don't know if that helps, but. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mark Davidson. I am on the vestry of an Episcopal church. And I um, promise you that Dave did not put me up to this or pay me any money to say this. But one of the things that happens to me, this is my second Mockingbird conference. One of the things that happens to me when I leave is I feel so utterly grateful to Jesus, that I just want to do anything for him. Hmm. That's not the normal mode of my heart. Hmm. Um, but it, one of the ways that, that I, and again, he did not put me up to saying this, but I actually feel like giving a lot of money to Mockingbird, right? And that's because nobody asks me to do this, right? There's nobody saying, Wait, uh, you know, you really, really need to do this. This is really, really important. Yeah. And 
uh, you, you know, we, we need your support desperately, and if you don't yeah. do this, it's all going to crash, right? all this kind of stuff. Don't but, forget about Liberate now. Well, okay. yeah. And then, but what I will say is that when it comes to uh, my church, we think a lot about uh, our capital, uh, not capital campaigns, our stewardship campaigns. And I give to my church because I'm supposed to. I give regularly, and I give very cautiously. Um, and we have had so many discussions about how to get people to give more money. We've had all the strategies. We've talked about Myers-Briggs tests, about why people are motivated, and different kinds of people are motivated in different ways, and how do we do this, and we brainstorm, and we put things in the bulletin, and we have people stand up and give testimonies. And we have actually this year, as a result of all these things, had an increase. It has worked. But it isn't what you're talking about. It's not like, I'll do anything for this church. Look, here's, all, here's as much money as I can possibly give you. So what does the gospel have to say to churches when it comes to stewardship campaigns? Yeah, that's good. Um, well, uh, I um, a couple things. One, I have, um, I have said before our church before, um, I could stand up and, um, and guilt you into writing some big checks. You know, I could, I could literally stand up and say, I know there are people in this church who have three homes and two, you know, two pews over is someone who's homeless. And I know some of you have three cars and I know a single mom who has to take the bus to work every day. And I, I mean, I could do that because those stats are real in our church. Uh, and I said, I could do that and make you rich people feel like crap. And you would probably write two or three really big checks. But you'll never write two or three hundred big checks unless something greater than fear and guilt motivates you. And that's what Paul does in Corinthians. He says, let me, let me tell you about the Macedonians. Okay, hey, Corinthians, let me tell you about the Macedonians. These, these people are poor and they've given us everything. In fact, they, they're, they keep coming back to us and asking us if they can give more and more and more. We can't stop them from even asking. And these people have nothing. Um, and he begins that section by saying, let me, tell you about, let me tell you about the effect that grace is having with the Macedonians. And then he talks about their generosity. Um, and then he goes on in, uh, this is 2 Corinthians 8 and then verse 8 and 9. He says, um, because Jesus, was, Jesus, be, Jesus became poor for you so that you might become rich. And he goes on to describe, and, and I, I told our church, I said, that's the, generosity can only happen, bona fide generosity can only happen to those whose hearts are grasped by the radical generosity of Jesus. And, and then it, I, so I told our church, I said, the real test of whether or not you guys are starting to get this as if I never have to preach a giving sermon, <laughs> you know? If you guys become like the, the, the grace of God has so radically transformed you on the inside that you're like, we want to give more. I mean, checks just pile in. You know, we haven't reached that point yet, so I keep preaching the gospel. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, I, you know, I don't, I don't know if, um, again, I, I don't, there's not some, I, I don't have a manual on stewardship. It's just, I do think that uh, giving is a fruit of uh, a heart that has been grasped by God's grace. And, and I'll say this too, real quick. Um, when you ask the question, so what are you going to do now that you don't have to do anything? What you discover, at least what I've discovered in my own life, is that when you realize you don't have to do anything for Jesus, something miraculous happens. You actually begin wanting to do everything for Jesus. Um, so, anyway. Oh, no. Here Good we go. Good God. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Isn't it time for the next session? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, um... Wait, no, wait a second. Before you ask a question, Jim, let me just tell you why I said that about Jim. All right? Jim McNeely is a good friend from uh, Washington State. He was at the first Liberate Conference, not this past February, so February 2012, right? And we were doing a question and answer period. And Jim felt like the, the Q&A was, you know, people weren't really being honest. They weren't really being open and transparent. So Jim decided to get the ball rolling. <laughs> 
So he said, you know, I have a son that, I got to be honest with you, sometimes I dream about uh, grabbing my gun and shooting him in the face. Does anybody else feel that? And everyone's like, oh my God. I mean, the security people and the police officers on set were like looking at me like, I was like, nah, it's fine. I feel the same way about my son. I just don't say it. Uh, anyway, so go ahead, Jim. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, I was gratified uh, recently, and I've seen a little more, I've seen more of this where people that, uh, leaders, church leaders and uh, Christian leaders are alarmed about the spread of the hyper grace movement. Of the what right? movement? That's what, that's the way, that's what they said. Hyper grace movement. Hyper gotcha. grace. Right. right? Yeah. That's what, that, in, in this particular article, that's what they were saying. Sure. And, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, I took the liberty of writing a scathing response to it, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, it was a great response. I read it. Yeah. Um, but the thing that actually gratified me was that, that reading through that site, there's a number of people that are alarmed about the spread of the grace movement, which I take as a tremendous victory. Yeah. Right. Although when I look around, I'm not sure I'm as convinced of the success of the spread of it yet. You know, I feel like I'm still fighting and I feel like I'm pretty isolated where I am. Hmm. Um, what, when you look out at the landscape of North America, hmm. what, what, what do you, how, how successful are we at doing this? Hmm. Where, how, are, are we really, is it spreading that alarmingly fast or... Hmm. Uh, you know, are we succeeding or what, what's yeah. the state? Um, gosh. I mean, there are. Glory. The uh, what? Uh, I said glory. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are succeeding. Overpowering and conquering the world. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I. Um, <laughs> there are pockets of encouraging places, you know. This is one of them. Um. I, uh, I, I live my life in the evangelical world, um, and, you know, there are, there are probably more places that discourage me and frustrate me than there are places that encourage me. Um, I, I think there is an acknowledgement. What Christian doesn't want to acknowledge the reality of grace, at least theologically? Um, but there's still a lot of butts and breaks, lots of butts and breaks. Um, yes, grace, but the very fact that people would refer to this as the radical grace movement or the hyper grace movement seems to, just, seems to suggest that, um, that there's grace and then there's radical grace. Or there's grace and then there's hyper grace. I don't know another grace that isn't hyper or radical. I mean, it's that counterintuitive. Uh, it turns everything upside down and inside out and wrecks all of our conditional categories. And um, So I, I don't know. I mean, I, um, I, I do look, in all honesty, I look at um, Mockingbird. I look at Liberate. I look at the pastors who come to Mockingbird and Liberate, the ones that we interact with, the ones who have tried it the other way who have crashed and burned um, and uh, are starting to get it now and they want help in how they should go about sort of changing the way they do ministry and changing the way they preach and that sort of thing. So, um, I mean, I, I, I think there are a few of us who are um, willing to take the shots and get it out there as far and wide as possible. Uh, we can sow and we can plant, but God alone gives the increase. That's God's business. So whether it spreads or not doesn't determine whether I'm going to say what saved my life or not. Um, and just sort of leave that stuff up to God. But I could go into much more detail, but that'll be in private. And then we can talk names and people and, you know, really slam some people and throw them under the bus. But we're not, I won't do that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Tully and I've really appreciated your honesty up front, and uh, and I loved um, how you shared briefly about how a couple had come and said that you really liked. You know, I have those people in my parish too, and they're like, well, we're just going to go on somewhere else because we want something to do, and you're like, great, we'll pray for you. But yeah. <laughs> uh, the people that you do like and that you've had relationships with, because we've had that too, you know, and they're like, uh, we're moving on, and you've really liked them. And it's like a personal, like, you lead, I mean, you're not happy about that at all, and you mm. feel rejected. How have uh, you and your wife coped with that rejection when, you know, parishioners and friends have said, uh, you know, this, you, you've, got, you've lost your mind? Yeah. And so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, gosh, there's no real simple answer to that. I think it, it stings every time it happens. I have to go back and say, what is it that stings? What's the stinger about that? Um, and if I'm honest, I'll say the sting, the, the reason I take it personally is because this is, this is a rejection of me. Um, and I just, I have to, seriously, I'm not being trite when I say this. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about the now power of the gospel. It saves me in those moments because uh, it's a reminder, it's a doxological declaration that um, because, because I have been forever approved and accepted uh, by God because of what Jesus has done, I'm free to be rejected. <laughs> in other words, this isn't, this isn't really about me. Uh, who I am has nothing to do with me fundamentally. Uh, my identity, my value, my worth has nothing to do with what I can do or what I can get other people to think about me. It's what Jesus has accomplished on my behalf. So um, wh what that frees me to do is when they leave, I honestly can love them and keep up with them. Like, so my wife and I, for instance, are literally uh, Monday, this coming up Monday, um, are taking them out to lunch. And my goal at that point is not to convince them to stay. My goal at that point is to say, whether you stay or go, I love you. And only the gospel can free you to do that. Because <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't need you to be, I don't need you to think I'm great in order to feel like I matter. Um, so, I, you know, it's just, it's hard. It's hard. I, I mean, it's, it's hard on my wife. You know, it just, it is. I mean, she was crying the other day. Just, you know, she, she said, you know, I used to... Um, she said, I used to hear stories from pastors about ministry being a lonely place. And I just didn't even know what they were talking about. Because we'd always been in places and <clears throat> surrounded by people who loved us. And, and now, I'm starting to, now I'm starting to get a sense of what they were talking about. You know, it's, she, she gets afraid. I get afraid, you know, to invest deeply in the people who come. Because what if they leave one day? You know, do I really want to invest in someone who God might take out of my life? Um, and if you've been a pastor for a long period of time, you know you've been hurt by enough people who have left your church, friends who have left, people who have left throwing, you know, throwing mud at you. Um, you just, it's, it's hard, you know, you kind of keep your cards close to the chest. And this is why this message alone can save you from that. Um, because I can give and give and give and give and give uh, because I don't need anything from you. And even if you slap me in the face, I can give. I can kiss. I can return a slap with a kiss. Um, because I just, I have everything I need. Now, we never believe that fully, which is why we have to keep preaching it to ourselves and to other people. Like Luther said, we have to preach the gospel to ourselves every day because we forget it every day. And we have to preach the gospel to our people every week because they forget it every week. So, anyway. You have to admit when you're, like, really tan, yeah. your skin is thicker. It is. From like My skin is like leather. Criticism. I, I sent a picture last night of RJ and me to Aaron Zimmerman and said, we miss you, you know, took a picture of us. And he says, Did George, does George Harrison know that you stole his tan? I was like, just shut up and go to sleep, Aaron. Anyway. George Hamilton, I think he meant. Yeah, George Hamilton. Yeah, Who did I say, Harrison? Yeah, he was. Yeah, he wasn't very tan. He was from, <laughs> no, he was white as a ghost. Yeah, George, <laughs> yeah, George Hamilton. He's the guy with the tan and the. Yeah. Yeah, I'm right. glad we cleared that up. Yeah, I'm glad we did too. <laughs> On that note, I would like to ask people just to hold the rest of the questions until after I get a chance to speak. Because <laughs> right? you'll probably answer all their questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just, just wait till you hear what I have to say. Thank you again, Tullian. Yeah.